Hey bag ladies and bag dudes, today I'm going to be talking about how to make your ruler slip proof. The two Aragon bags that I made this week, Marimekko fabrics, Little Deer embroidery kits, tidying up week number two. The book review will be for you and your sewing machine. I'll be demonstrating how to add a wrist strap to any bag and there's a great giveaway at the end. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everybody, happy Sunday or Monday afternoon, depending on what part of the world that you live in. Thank you so much for joining me. I see Audrey's watching. Libby from snowy Indiana. We had some snow in Chicago also. Kathy's also watching. Auntie Vic from Kansas. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to have you here. So I saw that it was Shelly's birthday today. Happy birthday, Shelly. And Sonia's granddaughter also had a birthday. Happy birthday to her as well. Uh, before I get started, a friendly reminder, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And also everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in finding out more about any of the notions, fabrics, books, or projects that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. So. As always, my favorite part of Social Sunday is the notion of the week. And this past week, some of my friends were talking about different uh, little gadgets or items that they use to make their rulers or quilting rulers non-slip. So I bought pretty much everything that my friends were recommending and I gave them a try out. And so I'm gonna jump over to the side camera, show you all of those little projects and what they look like on the ruler and give you the final word on which item makes rulers the most slip proof. Okay, so many, many things that I got to uh, share with you. The first one and the one that I thought that was the most unusual is a spray from Rust-Oleum. It's called anti-slip. So it's a slip resistant coating. So you spray, according to the directions, you spray a couple coats, at least a couple coats. You wanna make sure if you're using this though, you spray it outside. I made the mistake of, since it's so cold and snowy, spraying it in the basement and the fumes were just overwhelming. So you wanna make sure you're spraying it in a garage, outside somewhere. Um, maybe um, if you don't have a garage, uh, spray it outside in a covered cardboard box, something like that. So you spray it on the back of your template and when it dries, you need at least 24 hours for it to dry. When it dries, it looks clear and it's um, anti-slip. So it's, it's not uh, gonna slide right across your fabric. Um, I thought this was unusual, but uh, my friend Annie told me about it. Um, she was teaching and some ladies had this on the backs of their rulers. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, if you have any quilting rulers from the OmniGrid brand that are labeled OmniGrip, you might be familiar with these, but these already have a non-stick coating and basically all of the yellow and the numbered areas are the non-stick coating. So some rulers actually already come with this, um, mostly quilting rulers that I've seen. Um, another product that I got is from OmniGrid also and it's called Invisigrip. So it's basically, it comes on a, sh on a roll so you can co coat quite a few of your rulers and I, I coated one before the show, so I've already got one that's coated. I wanted to show you how to do it on camera though. So I cut a little piece of the off the roll and it, it advises you to use your rotary cutter and cut around the template. I don't have uh, my cutting mat over here, so I'm just gonna actually draw around it. And the directions actually say to cut approximately a quarter of an inch less than the size of the template. So I'm gonna freehand that, I'm not gonna measure it just gonna cut the piece out so it's slightly less than the size of the template. So I'm just eyeballing my quarter of an inch. Okay, so when you've cut that out, it's on a paper backing, like a cardstock backing, and you just peel it off. Kind of reminds me of a window cling, and you apply it to the back of the template. So as a window cling, um, I, I, it's got a couple bubbles, nothing too bad, but I find that it, it does help. It's not as slick as the template with, without any kind of coating. 
Um, it does kind of grab a little bit. So I coated both of these. I was pretty pleased with, with how that looked. Another friend recommended, um, I'm pretty sure you can find this at Walgreens or anywhere where you purchase uh, vitamins or medications, things like that. Um, it's from Next Clear and it's, it just says flexible clear tape. So I put a few pieces on the back of the template. The only problem with this is it, while it does provide a little bit of extra non-slip for the template, it, you can probably see on camera, you can see um, it's not exactly clear anymore. So um, again, this is the next care. I feel like it's um, a similar outcome as to the Omni Grip uh, that I used on the back of the first two templates. Um, again, that's the next care. I find that I found that this was the cheapest out of all the options. So if you're looking for something that you can pick up easily, something that's super cheap, um, one roll will last pretty much forever. All right, so another item that I picked up is by the company called True Cut, and this product is called True Grips. And I put a couple on the ruler before the show, and basically it's like a silicone, um, like donut shape. You can probably see that if I hold it over the pink fabric. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull some out. There's a bunch of, um, let me see how many are in the package. Uh, 15 small and 15 large come in the package. And you just peel it off the, the brown paper and they stick to the ruler. Um, I had a hard time the first time I, I applied these to get it off the, the paper. So let me see if I can do a little better this time. All right, so I have some paper still sticking there. Let me, ah, uh, there we go. And then you just stick it anywhere on the ruler where it won't um, interfere with if there's any text on the, on the ruler or the acrylic template. So. This one's uh, about the same resistance to the other two methods that I tried before. And again, you can obviously see the little donut shapes over here. Again, these are called True Grips. And I have, I think, one more to show you. So this last product is by Steady Buddy, which they also make um, pressing mats. And I have my Steady Buddy uh, foot pedal for my sewing machine. And these are just little foam strips that come on um, stickered backings. So I stuck a few onto the back of the template before the show. Um, I should mention in the instructions for these uh, Steady Buddy Ruler Buddies, if at, at any time you want to remove these, they recommend just using some rubbing alcohol, so something easy that most people probably have in their home already. If you want, if you decide one day that you don't like the look of the ruler beddies on your templates or you want to move them. So you just pu peel the, the paper backing away and you can just stick it wherever you'd like to on the ruler. And there's a whole bunch, so this will last a really long time. I found out of all of the methods that I just showed you, this is the one that truly does not budge. Uh, because it's foam, the foam really does honestly grip the fabric. And if you're having trouble with your ruler slipping, as long as you don't mind seeing those little gray strips on the back of your template, this is the one that I found that slips the least, or honestly, not at all. So um, this one was the Steady Betty Ruler Betty, but I have linked to all of these products in the description. So if you think a different method might be for you, perhaps um, the True Grips, or maybe you liked the Invisigrip um, roll, um, all of those are linked to in the description so you can find out more information or um, if you just like to purchase the one that you liked the best, they're all linked to in the description and all there for you. So I actually did a bit of sewing this week. You may be surprised to hear this, but um, I would say a majority of the weeks, unless I'm preparing a demo for Social Sunday, a lot of the times I'm not even sewing at all during the week, but this week I sewed two bags. So I made two Aragon bags. I, um, the Aragon bag is part of the next four pack video bundle. So we shot the video for that. So I had to make one for the video. And I also refreshed the instructions for the Aragon bag. Um, the Aragon bag was written in 2013, the first year that I started um, selling and designing patterns. While there were no, no errors in the original pattern, I thought it would be nice to update with a different um, style of assembly. So. The original Aragon bag was finished with bias binding on the lining, and I know um, not everyone's a fan of bias binding, so I, I changed the instructions. It's not a drop-in lining either. Everything's just sewn right sides together and turned like a lot of other bags, and so um, to refresh the instructions, I also needed to take all new step photos. So I, I made two bags this week, so 
I'll pop those up and, and show both of them to you. So the first one is made using an art a fabric from Art Gallery Fabrics. I used some um, Moda Grunge fabrics. I'm finding, I'm really liking having lots of colors of the Moda Grunge because I can find just about any color that I need to match to my project. And I like using it for the lining and it's good for straps also. So this is the first Aragon bag that I made. It's got um, elastic pockets, both on the outside and inside. So there's elastic pockets in the same position in the lining. There's a back zippered pocket right here. There's also a zipper pocket in the lining and of course this front pocket that's uh, secured with a magnetic snap. So this is the first Aragon bag that I made this week. And here's the second one. I made this one using fabrics from Ana Maria Horner and of course the, the Moda Grunge for my straps and for the lining. So I was really happy with bo how both of these came out. I'm not sure which one I like better. Um, maybe you can weigh in and help me decide. Um, do you like the blue one better, this one right here? Or do you like the green one better? Um, I don't know. Danny, which one do you like better? The right. The right? The blue one? Okay. That's your left. It's ours and yours. Right here. Yes. Danny likes the green one better. So I can't decide. Again, uh, the next four pack video bundle will be out on January 31st. It'll be four brand new videos that we haven't released before. Um, two actually, two new patterns this time. Um, we'll be in the bundle and we'll be selling the patterns and videos separately so if you're only interested in one of the projects you can just pick up the one that you like and again that'll be January 31st and I'll be showing all of the projects um, hopefully next week we still have a lot of filming to do for that um, so I have a question for you let me know in the comments do you own a bag specifically for carry-on travel such as on an airplane or possibly a train if you prefer to travel by train um, my most favorite, well, I have two favorite bags that I use for carry-ons. The, the the airplane bag and the, the Aragon bag is probably, those two are the ones that I've used the most for carry-on travel. The either, Both of those bags fit under the seat in an airplane. I can still fit tons of things inside. If I purchase a drink at the airport, I can have it handy in one of the side pockets, have my cell phone handy in one of the zipper pockets. So it really works well for me for um, carry on and especially if I need to have um, a few bits of clothing like a sweater or other things it fits a ton inside so it's a really great carry on as well as a diaper bag which is what I originally designed the Aragon bag for all right so I only have one new fabric that I added to my stash this week uh, but it's one I've been waiting to purchase for a really long time so I'm gonna step over to the side camera and show you that new fabric in my stash so this is Miramecco, and it's um, a design house from Finland. And you may recognize uh, this floral motif. I think that's probably the most famous uh, Miramecco fabric. And it's not the cheapest. It was a little bit pricey, which is probably why I waited so long to purchase it. But I'm using it in my uh, Reason to Bag, which we're gonna be filming this week. And I just thought, you know what? Now's the time to get it. So I just bought a yard. I found some on Etsy which um, came from overseas. It does come in other colors. I noticed a really pretty um, royal blue pr print in the same um, floral motif. But um, anyway, I feel like it's such an iconic design. Thought it was time to pick some up. So I just got the one yard and I have a lot left so I can use it for another project as well. I also purchased these really cute embroidery kits by Little Deer on Etsy. So I purchased two different types of kits. Let me show you the first type. Let me pull these out of the plastic so they're not so shiny. So I purchased these two embroidery hooped projects. So there's a unicorn and a, a really cute fox. So these come pre-printed on the fabric so you don't have to transfer your embroidery design. So here's the size of the fabric. And it also comes with instructions and also a color guide for um, where to stitch and actually what type of stitch. So, so she tells you that in the, the design. The fox only needs four colors. The unicorn needs just a few more. So I thought these were really cute. These I thought these would be cute to use for just like hooped artwork in the sewing room. And I also picked up these little doll kits. So these are also hand printed on fabric with the design. Um, these are just going to be little stuffed dolls. So here's the, here's the fabric. So it's the front of the bunny and the back of the bunny. You'll notice the seam allowance is included. Also included in the kit is um, the stuffing, 
um, some floss, a needle, so everything needed to make the project as well as the instructions is included in the kit. And the same thing for the other, I got a little fox and a little bunny. So I just thought these were cute as you can see. Um, here's my scissors right here. It's, a, it's a, a little small stuffy, but it shouldn't take too long to embroider. And I thought it would just be something cute to put on the, the shelf in my sewing room. So again, these kits are from Little Deer on Etsy. And the link is in the description in case you're interested in seeing more. She has not only embroidery kits, but she has really cute wool um, stuffies. She had a bunch for uh, Chinese New Year, which I have always thought were really cute. And you can check those out by checking that link in the description. All right, uh, Danny's favorite part of the Sunday show. We'd like to ask all the bag ladies and bag dudes to go ahead and type either bag lady or bag dude in the comments now. I really like seeing all those bag lady and bag dude com comments come through on the screen. I can see Danny's monitor from here. And I saw some of the bag dudes talking before the show. They were doing accounts. Um, I saw Renee was watching, Jeff was watching, two marks. I know Charlie's uh, often watching. Sometimes Charlie watches uh, later on in the week if he has something going on on Sunday. So there are definitely bag dudes that are watching and sewing up some bags. And um, hopefully the sling backpack that's coming out at the end of the month will satisfy some of the, the bag dudes. Because I know Danny's looking forward to making either making his own sling backpack or maybe I'll make him one. Uh, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, all right, uh, a little update. Last Sunday I talked about tidying up. I read uh, the books by Marie Kondo and she also has a show on Netflix. So in case you missed last Sunday, Danny's gonna go ahead and put some graphics of Marie's books on the screen just so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, or maybe not, uh, here we go. Uh, her first book is called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, and I know it seems like a simple idea, but uh, she has a very specific method for um, culling things out of your house and keeping only the things that spark joy, and so that's why the second book is called Spark Joy. Um, she has an, a show on Netflix that came out recently called Tidying Up, and um, each episode is Marie visiting a family and helping them tidy their house up. and. I know it sounds super simple, but it really works. And I've, I've enjoyed going through my clothes and only keeping the things that I really, really love. Um, I, we used her folding method, the whole family did, and it's been so much easier finding clothes to wear and getting the most out of the clothes that I do have because how I was folding things and putting things away before, Basically, I was pulling the thing, the clothes off the top of the pile in the drawer every time, and so the clothes at the bottom of the pile were really not getting much love. I was just wearing the same things over and over, and not that you have to have a lot of clothes, but I'd like to look uh, different. I'd like to not wear the same outfit on Social Sunday every Sunday, and so it's really helped a lot. Um, yesterday and today, we completed step two, which was uh, books. So step one was clothing. Step two is books, and I also combined books with stuffed animals. So uh, me and the kids went through all of our books. We decided which ones to keep, which ones to donate. So we donated a lot of books um, and stuffed animals to charity today. So it was 10 boxes of books, six bags of stuffed animals, and a few um, remaining pieces of clothing. So I was really happy, not only that we were able to donate some things that somebody else might get some use out of, we donated to Salvation Army, but uh, we also minimized what we have, and so we can hopefully keep things more tidy around the house. Um, I find it more helpful to have less because it's so much easier to straighten up. Uh, when, I, when I take something out, I'm trying to get in the habit of putting it away, and I've noticed I've been doing that with my clothes because I want to keep everything folded nicely how it looks currently. So um, I'm really enjoying that, and I know tidying up is not for everyone, but it's definitely... Um, been a big improvement in the Lawson household. Um, step number three is paper, which I'm gonna skip, be able to skip that step. Uh, paper means uh, bills, documents, all of that sort of thing. Um, so for step three, since most of our bills are auto pay, um, paid online, I don't have lots of paperwork in the office. The only papers that I save are receipts and things that I need for our business for taxes. Um, so that's pretty much it. As far as papers go, I have saved some of the kids' artwork, um, but it's really a small box over the years, so I feel like I feel like I'm safe as far as step three and paper. So let me know if you've done um, the Con Mari method um, from uh, Marie Kondo, if it worked for you. Let me know in the comments, but um, I'm super happy with that whole process. I'm gonna tackle it on my sewing machine, uh, sorry, 
sewing room, but probably not until after we move just because there's so much stuff in the sewing room. Jackie says, binge watched the whole series, then tried folding my clothing. Couldn't believe something so simple really worked. Yeah, Jackie, it, it super does work. And like I said, I know it's not for everyone. I was telling my grandma about it. Uh, we call my grandma Amma. Um, but Amma was really not. Uh, Amma might be watching right now. I think she is. Uh, she watches on YouTube on her cell phone. But anyway. Hi, Oma. <laughs> Danny says, hi, Amma. Anyway, I know tidying up is not for everyone. I know it's not for Amma, but um, it worked for us. So um, looking forward to finishing off the steps and getting to the sewing room eventually. So the book review for this week is for a book called You and Your Sewing Machine. And I was recommended this book by a viewer and I was so happy that I was because honestly, I, I probably would not have looked at this book if it wasn't for the recommendation. And it was really packed with a lot of useful information. So I'm gonna grab that, that book and I'll see you over on the side camera. Okay, so here's what the book looks like. Uh, you and Your Sewing Machine and the great thing about this book is it applies to any machine. So no matter what kind of machine you have, it's basic information and they cover all the parts for every different type of machine. It's written by Bernie Tobish and he's actually a, a sewing machine technician. He worked for Singer for many years and then he had his sewing machine dealership. So he really knows his stuff. And the whole book is information that you can use. Obviously you wanna combine the information in the book with uh, your sewing machine manual because every sewing machine has very specific information but he goes through uh, different parts of the sewing machine so this first chapter is getting to know your sewing machine so he covers all of the different parts of all of the different types of machines so uh, drop in bobbins um, um, industrial bobbin cases all of them are pictured and this book is definitely picture heavy so I liked seeing all the different photographs. He shows um, mechanical sewing machines versus electronic sewing machines, the insides. And then there's also a picture of a computerized sewing machine, the insides. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, needle plates, like I said, every part of the machine is covered and he shows lots of different examples in the photographs. Um, knee lifts, uh, which my machine has and I don't get a whole lot of use for just because I'm moving my machine around so much. Um, bobbin casings, he shows all the different kinds because he talks about these later in the book as well. Um, he has two pages in here, questions to ask when buying a new sewing machine, questions that you can ask your dealer um, so you can get the sewing machine that's right for you. And um, next chapter is called Maintaining Your Good Relationship uh, with the Sewing Machine. So. He talks about feet. He shows photographs of all of the different types of sewing machine feet that you would use. And again, these will vary depending on your sewing machine brand, but I find that all in all, um, the main part components or parts, like all walking feet look very similar to either of these. Open sold foot, closed sole. Um, I had to look at these photos really close for a minute because they looked almost exactly the same. It was just missing a little piece of metal right here, which makes this open sole, which shows you more of where you're sewing through. Servicing a walking foot, which can be very useful for many people, especially the quilter, although a lot of bag makers use the walking feet for um, sewing over thick layers. Edge stitch feet, um, patchwork or quarter inch foot, and uh, all the rest of the feet are talked about as well. All right, cleaning and lubricating. Super, super important. He talks about this for different parts of the machine. You wanna make sure, obviously, you refer to your sewing machine manual because not every machine needs oil and some machines need very specific sewing machine oil. So you wanna make sure you know that before you get into the oiling. Um, an oscillating bobbin, which is what I have here. He shows you how to remove it, where to put the oil. So again, very helpful information and stuff I never would have thought of. And I like having the clear photos because my sewing machine manual obviously is just illustrations and it's sometimes hard to know um, what it looks like in real life. Um, he reminds you, don't forget about your feed dogs, clean this area out. He shows uh, with the, the plate off and what it would look like, how you should clean it out. And um, let me skip to the next chapter because there was a few things that I bookmarked. So. Um, he talked about uh, going over heavy seams, what to do with that. 
I thought this was particular interesting, particularly interesting, so that's why I bookmarked it. Um, and I know this applies to us since we're bag makers and we're using either spray-based or fusible stabilizers. Um, he, he says right here, um, let me read this right, this little portion for you right here. Um, Products like fusible stabilizers were created to help make some sewing tasks easier. Some of them can, can create problems for you, however. It is important to make sure that the product was designed to be used with a sewing machine. Very sticky glues can interfere with proper stitch formation. The thread is prevented from forming the right size loop behind the needle, and your machine may start skipping stitches and breaking thread. If you see a ring of glue form around the needle, this is often the clue. If you are experiencing either of these problems and you have just started using a product that involves glue, you may have to switch to a lighter version. When you are using a product with glue, check the area under the needle, which he shows right here, under the needle plate in the feed dogs, and you might find buildup there. This is this will need to be removed. So he's showing you some buildup, and um, this can happen to any of us. And I like having the photograph there because he's showing you exactly where you need to be on the lookout for and what you need to be cleaning. So. Um, the next chapter is problems and how to fix them, and then um, tension in the relationship. So he, so he shows through these photographs um, how tension works. Um, I bookmarked another spot over here. I thought this was interesting because he, he shows a little sample of white fabric. He shows black thread and then white thread. And when I look at this, the, the white thread looks great and the black thread looks a little bit off. Um, this is an exercise that he completed after he calibrated the machine correctly. Um, let me get to the part that I wanted to read. Um, the reason for this exercise is to explain that whenever the stitching is going to show, it is a good idea to test sew. Top stitching, machine quilting, and buttonholes are good examples where you may want to limit how much contrast there is be between thread and fabric. So because it's white fabric and black thread, that's a high contrast. Right here, here's the black fabric and the black thread and the stitches look really good. He says, interestingly, using light thread on dark fabric does not create as bad a look. So he's basically, he's saying the tension's correct, everything's right, but the stitches look a little different with the black thread on the white fabric and the white stitches look normal or they look good. So that's an interesting point to keep in mind when you're choosing what color threads you're using for your fabrics. Um, he mentioned right here, it's hardly ever the tension. So there's several things that might be going on with your machine. You might be assuming it's a tension, uh, a tension problem. He talks about burrs on the hook of your bobbin casing, which can cause a lot of problems. And I think I never would have thought of something like that, but he shows you how to check for that. Damage to the bobbin casing, incorrect threading. I know this happens to me a ton and I've gotten emails on this in the past. Um, people are having problems with their um, thread looking funny. My first step is always to, to re-thread the whole machine and also to um, reinsert the bobbin in the bobbin casing and re-thread that also. Because even if one little piece of thread comes off one of the areas in the thread guide, that's gonna make your stitches look really bad. It talks about other things that might be causing problems that are not tension, using the wrong size thread stopper, um, all sorts of things, very specific and covered in photos. So I thought this was very helpful. Um, overfilled bobbins, um, things that we might take for granted but make a really big difference. Um, I bookmarked one other area in the book that I wanted to talk to you about, um, when to adjust the pressure. Sometimes, and I know I get confused sometimes also when adjusting the presser foot pressure. Um, he has two photo examples that I thought were helpful that I wanted to talk about too much pressure. He says, something as simple as sewing two pieces of fabric together can be a problem if there is too much pressure. The top layer of fabric, which is the green fabric, the bottom layer is the black fabric, the top layer of fabric can end up longer than the bottom and accuracy becomes more difficult. Imagine trying to piece a quilt under this circumstance. All the shifting and stretching of the top layer would make for a very wrinkly result. So here's the top fabric, the green. As you can see, it's not even at all with the black fabric. Right here, another photo, lowering the setting allows the top layer to be transported at the same rate as the bottom and both layers end up the same length. As you can see, same length right here. So your presser foot pressure is definitely important. So there's lots of other things covered in the book. Uh, forward reverse balance adjustment. Um, this guy really knows his stuff. It's presented really well in the book and I find that this book, in addition to your sewing machine manual, 
will be really helpful in tackling pretty much anything that might be going wrong with your sewing machine before you have to take it out to a technician. Um, some things you can take care of at home rather than spending your time or money um, taking your machine in when it might be a simple fix. So again, uh, the book was called You and Your Sewing Machine and I thought it was really helpful and um, thanks to the person that recommended it to me because um, I'll be definitely hanging on to this in my sewing room. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments. Uh, do you ever look at your sewing machine manual? I admit when I first got my sewing machine, I did look at the manual. I found it was rather confusing to figure out how to thread it at first. It was hard seeing the two dimensional drawings in the manual and figuring that out. So I turned to YouTube videos. I find it's always helpful, especially if you're really into your sewing machine or you want to get some help if you ever come across a problem. There's a group on Facebook for just about every different type of sewing machine. I'm in a Juki group and I've been in a Juki group for several years and I linked in case you have a Juki like I have, um, I've linked to that Facebook group for the Juki TL sewing machines in the description. But over the years I've had to ask several questions and um, I've gotten the answer very quickly. So it's helpful to be in a group. Um, I, I'm also in some sewing um, embroidery machine groups uh, as well and they're super helpful. There's always a few experts in the group that can help with any questions. All right, so my demonstration for tonight is how to add a wrist strap to any bag or a pouch um, if you want to add a wrist strap to a small project. So um, what I mean by a wrist strap is this little, little guy right here. You can slide your wrist in it and go out with either a clutch, a pouch, or if you want to add it to a small bag. So. Here's another example of a bag that might benefit by having, instead of the strap, a wrist strap. So all you need to add a wrist strap to any project is two bits of hardware. You'll need a half inch D-ring, and the D-ring is the one that's attached to the bag by a little piece of fabric, and you'll also need a half inch swivel clip. So this is the swivel clip. As you can see, it can clip on or off of your project. You, according to this demonstration, you'll need to cut two items of fabric. So you'll need your strap, You'll need to cut the strap 13 inches by 2 inches and you'll want to interface that with Pellon Shape Flex. And then you'll also need the tab. So the strap is this piece and the tab is a little piece that you can skip the interfacing on since it's so small. But your tab piece you'll cut to 1.5 inches by 2 inches. So again, the strap will be 13 inches by 2 inches, the tab will be 1.5 inches by 2 inches, and you can follow the instructions in this video for adding a wrist strap to any bag or pouch. So enjoy. Okay, now go ahead and pull out your strap, and there's only one tab piece, so pull out the tab piece as well. So let's start with the strap. Flip it over so that it's wrong side facing up, and we're gonna be pressing so that it's wrong sides together and the long edges are aligned. Okay, open out the fabric, and then we're gonna press the bottom edge in toward the center crease. And then same thing with that top edge. Okay, go ahead and refold the fabric and then press it one more time. Okay, I'm going to actually place a few wonder clips on the strap edges for now. I'll just place one in the middle. All right, we're going to press the tab in the same manner. So again, flipping so that it's wrong side facing up. I'm going to press it wrong sides together in half so that the short ends meet. And then same thing, I'm going to also press in toward the center crease. Okay, now we're going to add the swivel clip. So the swivel clip should have an opening of a half an inch. So I'm going to take that wonder clip off there for now, and we're going to slide the fabric through the opening. 
And then I'm going to temporarily unfold the fabric on either end because we're going to be placing the fabric right sides together along the short ends. Obviously make sure it's not twisted. And we're going to sew this short end using a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Okay, press that seam open. And then let's refold that fabric along the initial pressing. And I'm going to place wonder clips as I work around the strap. I'm also going to place a wonder clip on that tab piece. So we're going to top stitch both of the finished edges of the tab using an eighth of an inch seam allowance and we'll do the same thing for the strap and as you're sewing just move that swivel clip out of the way. Okay, and since that strap piece was a little bit thicker, I'm going to go ahead and increase my stitch length for this top stitching of the strap. My normal stitch length is two and a half millimeters, and I'm going to increase to three millimeters. Okay, and this next step is optional, but it helps to anchor the strap. So I'm going to go ahead and move the swivel clip so that it's not an area where the seam is. And I'm going to stitch two lines of stitches about a half an inch away from the metal hardware. So this just helps so that the swivel clip is not moving around on the strap. Okay, now we're going to add the D-ring to the tab piece. So I'm just going to go ahead and fold it in half. Slide the D-ring on the middle. I'm going to put a wonder clip on there for just a second. And I'm going to pull out the piece with the zipper on it. I'm going to mark down three quarters of an inch from the top edge. And that will be the placement for the tab piece. Okay, so the tab is going to go three quarters of an inch down, so it's really close to the zipper. It will be out of the way when the pouch is finished. And I'm just going to anchor this down using an eighth of an inch seam allowance. I hope you've enjoyed that demonstration, and that's how to add a wrist strap to any bag or pouch that you'd like to have a wrist strap on. And again, it's removable, so you can also have a regular traditional 
longer strap on your bag as well. So I'd like to invite you now, if you're watching on Facebook, to hit the share button right now and share this sewing video with your other sewing friends on Facebook. If you're watching on YouTube, I hope if you're not already subscribed to our YouTube channel already, I hope you'll hit the subscribe button and then you can be notified of our future live videos, our future sewing tutorials. Uh, at the very least, I hope you'll at least hit the like button, which is a little icon of a thumbs up and they have that on both Facebook or YouTube. So the likes and shares really help us out so much. So thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate it. All right, so I'm going to announce the winner of last week's giveaway and then I'm going to answer some questions live. So if you have a question for me, either a bag related question, sewing related question, question about a notion or tool, go ahead and type your question in the comments right now. Danny's gonna put a few questions on the screen for me and I'll answer as many as I can live. So first, uh, the winner of last week's uh, giveaway was Joy Stat. so congratulations to you, Joy. I contacted Joy in social media and I already heard back from her, so we'll be shipping off your prize to you tomorrow, um, actually Tuesday, since tomorrow's a holiday. So again, congratulations to you, Joy. And uh, now on to the questions. I see Danny's got one queued up already. Debbie says, how do you get a good consistent eighth of an inch top stitch? So um, I do have a foot, uh, I think it's right over here. Let me see if I can grab it. Depending on your sewing machine brand, you may have a similar foot available. So um, I recently picked up this foot. It's called a right compensating foot for the Juki. It's a 1.5 millimeter foot and it's basically got a metal bar on the side. Um, which gives um, the metal bar is about an eighth of an inch away from where the needle comes down. So if you have a foot like this, um, an edge stitch or top stitch foot, um, if not, I used to previously eyeball a spot on my regular sewing machine foot for that eighth of an inch. You can also put a little dot with a permanent marker or use a bit of washi tape. Um, to lay it down on the foot as well so it, it can help you eye up your seam. They also make magnetic uh, seam guides that you can just, um, they're magnetized so you can just put it on the bed of your sewing machine wherever you need to have it uh, to get a certain seam allowance. So all of those um, you can also put, I also have washi tape on the bed of my sewing machine. So there's multiple options for getting that eighth of an inch um, overall. Um, eyeballing it I found worked okay for me in the past and also don't stress about it too much. You can always do a little bit of practicing to, to see where that eighth of an inch falls for you and your machine. Um, but if you need to make an adjustment, if you need to do a top stitch that's a little bit bigger than an eighth of an inch, as long as you're consistent, that's the most important thing. Um, Alicia says, does the rivet get in your way when sewing the bag closed? Um, I'm not sure what that question was in regards to, um, sorry, I'm not sure, but if you want to follow up either in the comments or you can email me after the show, my email is sarah at sosweetness.com and that's Sarah with no H. Stephanie says, I'm going to make an adjustable shoulder strap for a small bag. Question, do you have a general rule of thumb for how long you cut the piece of fabric for that strap so that it, it adjusts enough? So um, it really depends on the person. For me, I like to cut my strap fabrics um, from salvage to salvage, so that usually, depending on the fabric, usually ends up being um, 45 inches for regular quilting cotton. Um, if I'm using um, a decorator weight fabric or canvas, uh, 60 inches. If you, if uh, it might depend on the size of the person also. Um, if you need to piece um, maybe one and a half uh, widths of salvage to salvage fabric to get a longer strap. You certainly can. I've seen people that like using that 45 inches plus half that. So they're cutting two strips. And I do have a video on my YouTube channel on how to make a longer cork strap. You can also apply that to quilting cotton or canvas, whatever you're making, to make your strap fabric longer to get an adjustable strap. So at minimum, I would cut from salvage to salvage. If you like a really, really long strap or you want to uh, perhaps throw it over your shoulder and have it over your back, um, or for different sizes of person, you may consider cutting uh, from salvage to salvage and then add at least another um, half of the width of fabric to that first salvage to salvage piece. Barb says, when sewing bags and using soft and stable and or foam, one ends up uh, with bulky seams. Do you trim the foam to make the seams less bulky? So what I commonly do when I'm working on a bag, if I'm sewing with a, a half inch seam allowance, um, I'll uh, trim the seam in half to a quarter of an inch. You can also grade the seam. 
I believe I did a video last year um, on how to grade seams as well. When you're grading a seam, basically you're cutting one half of the seam, um, so um, one half of the seam smaller than the other. So I don't know if I have anything handy to demonstrate that. Maybe perhaps just check out the video. That would be the easiest thing. But grading the seams help it lie more flat because both uh, halves of the seam are not on top of each other, creating extra bulk. Having that one smaller piece cut um, half the size of the other seam helps it um, create, I guess, more of a smooth transition, um, if you will. Uh, Kim says, can we see the inside of the Aragon bag? Just wondering if a zipper is inside. Um, there actually is. Let me pull one of these guys up on the table. Um, perhaps I'll pull this one. This one's got some blue and red fabric in the lining. Might be easier to see. Okay, so one half of the bag is, uh, the zipper is on one half, just like the zipper on the outside. It's the same size of zipper. And on the other half of the inside of the bag, there's um, a get, um, an elastic pocket, um, the whole uh, width of the bag. So um, I sewed down the middle to create uh, two dividers and then on the ends there's also, uh, it's hard, <laughs> uh, it's hard looking at things on camera because sometimes things are backwards. So there's um, gathered elastic pockets just like there are on the outside. So one on either end. Um, so if it's the bags being used for a baby bag, it's helpful for a bottle and other things like shoes or other items that you need to grab in a hurry. If you're using it for a carry-on travel bag like I do, um, it's handy for having a water bottle here. Sometimes if I need to throw my cell phone somewhere really quickly, I'll put it in one of the side pockets or the inner pockets. So tons of pockets in this bag and I really like the elastic pockets. I think they look pretty neat and um, it's nice that they can expand to hold a water bottle. Um, Diane says, when will the templates for the Cumberland backpack be available? So I actually got the samples for the Cumberland backpack and the Sublime bag the acrylic templates before the weekend. So I would say maybe a week and a half to two weeks possibly. So uh, maybe before the end of January, we'll have those in stock. And I'll announce it on the live shows and on social media as soon as we get those in. Gretchen says, I've made my January challenge, the Metro double zip bag, but where do I post it? So I post all of the challenges on my blog. So you can go to sosweetness.com backslash blog. Um, it should be one of the more recent posts. Um, you just want to look for the one that says obviously Metro double zip pouch because that's the challenge for the month of January. And you want to scroll down almost to the bottom of the screen. There will be a blue button that says add your link. And you just click that. You can upload your photograph and um, that's pretty, that's all you need to do. Um, possibly you may need to resize your photo to a smaller photo. Some cell phone photos are really, really humongous. Um, I like the free website PicMonkey for making edits to photos. You can also do cool things like adjusting the lighting. Um, perhaps you took your photo um, in the house at night when you had the lights on in the house so you can brighten your photographs up in PicMonkey and you can also use a free app on your cell phone. Um, it's called a color story. So I've used both of those in the past. I like both of them. You can add text or other fun features to your photographs that way. So um, those are two options in case you need to resize your photo. Leah says, have you ever had your thread come out of your previously uh, threaded needle while sewing? If so, why does this happen? Um, let me grab my water really quick. I have had that happen in the past. Um, <clears throat> I honestly, I'm not sure why it happens exactly, but maybe somebody watching knows and can type that in the comments. If Danny catches it, he'll put it up on the screen. Happens to me every once in a while. Um, I just re-thread everything, uh, take the bobbin out, put it back in, and everything seems to be working as normal after that. Beth says, Sarah, I wanted to recommend uh, to share a book recommendation for your upcoming book club, The Sewing Machine by Natalie Fergie. A actually, where is it? Actually, I recently got it in the mail, so <laughs> I was going to wait, but... Um, uh, I guess I'll give you a sneak peek. This is going to be book number one of the book club, which is starting next week. So <clears throat> it's a six month book club. I've chosen six fiction books that have some sort of sewing related twist to them, either um, some of them involved garment sewing, some of them involved quilt making. This particular one involves a sewing machine and um, I'll read just the cover. It says one sewing machine, two families, three secrets, four generations millions of stitches. So this will be book number one. I had a little bit of a hard time finding this one. I had to get a used copy. 
but the ebook version is also available if you have an ebook reader or if you just prefer to read books on your cell phone. But this will be the first book, and I'll be talking about the book club more in February. But in case you want to get a hold of your book early, this will be uh, book number one for the six month book club, and I'll also be introducing some free video projects for bags and other little accessories. So six projects in all, every month we do book club, I'll have a, a cool free video for you in addition to the book club. So um, this will be the first month. Um, Catch the lozenge. Oh, <laughs> Danny's throwing me some <laughs> cough drops. It's, you know, so it's. I feel like the house has been drier lately. I know we do use a humidifier up in the bedroom, but that's upstairs yeah, humidifier and- Humidifier in a furnace too. Sometimes when I'm talking for almost an hour, my throat just sort of starts to give up, but <laughs> apologize for that. Uh, Gina says, is there any fabric you don't need interfacing for? I'm making an airplane bag and the cotton that I chose to go with it is a little firm. Can I omit the interfacing or will that mess things up? So I guess it depends on the style of the bag. Uh, for lining fabric, certainly if you're using a decorator weight fabric or canvas fabric, I'm always totally okay to skip the shape flex on the lining if you're using one of those thicker fabrics for your lining fabric. For the exterior, that's tough because skipping the interfacing, even with a more firm fabric, might cause the bag to look a bit more floppy. The foam really gives a lot of structure, makes the bag stay up on its own. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I might probably still use the foam interfacing might still, I'd probably still consider using the Peltex, which is used for the bottom to make uh, more of a stiff bottom just because it's such a big bag. And I'm assuming you'll be putting lots of clothes or other things in the bag. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I'd make any changes necessarily. Um, the only thing is um, per the instructions, the Peltex is cut smaller minus the seam allowance, but I'd consider using, um, unless you wanted a softer or a bag that you could just fold up and put in a suitcase, then it would be okay to skip the, the foam and the other interfacings. All right, Danny's calling it on the questions. Um, I apologize if I did not get to your question live, but I'll be answering more questions on my live show. Every Tuesday I go live for Ask Sarah and Danny jo joins me on the Tuesday shows and I answer a lot more questions on um, Ask Sarah as well. All right, so the giveaway for this week, I have a lot of, um, rather large uh, remnants of cork fabric. And by rather large, I mean almost eight, almost normal sized rolls of the cork. Uh, I think this one's probably about 17 inches. Uh, we usually sell them 18 inches uh, in height, but I've got six rolls of cork to give away for tonight. Tried to pick some interesting colors that went together. Uh, I'm running out of hand, so I'll show you the last two over here. Uh, six rolls of cork will be given away to one randomly drawn winner at the end of the day this Saturday. So all you need to do to enter the giveaway is type your answer to my question in the comments on either YouTube or Facebook. And you don't have to be watching live. You can be watching later on in the week. My giveaway question is, what is your favorite novel? So just go ahead and type that in the comments right now. So um, again, thank you so much for joining me for Social Sunday. I had a great time. I hope you did as well. I'll see you again next Sunday at 7 p.m. Central Time. Have a great rest of the week and um, happy sewing. <laughs>